1 John 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that He has borne concerning His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of Him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. One of the great pictures in the scriptures is that the followers of Jesus are called conquerors. When we study the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation at the end of this year, we will see that those Christians who remain faithful are described as conquerors and are given crowns. John writes to these first century Christians who are dealing with false teachers and false teachings and is telling them that they are the ones who are the conquerors. Now the first picture of those who conquer here in chapter 5 and verse 1 are those who practice joyful obedience. John begins with a truth that he has established from the beginning of this letter. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. The false teachers were denying that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. John is not merely speaking about what the person claims with his mouth, but the confession that leads to life change. Everyone who loves the Father also loves those who are born of God. John has been talking about love a lot in this letter. In fact, this is just the summation of chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. If we love God, then we will also be loving our Christian brothers and sisters. You know you are in a relationship with God when you love one another. Notice how John amplifies this teaching in verse 2. John's statement is a reversal of what we would expect to read. We would expect to read that we know we have the love of God by loving the children of God. That has been John's point, again, to his readers throughout this letter. John reverses the statement and shows us how important loving each other truly is. This is how we know that we are loving the children of God, when we love God and obey His commands. 
Just as one cannot love God without loving his children, so also it is impossible to truly love the children of God without loving God also. We are not going to deny ourselves for the gain of each other if we do not truly love God. To be in a relationship with God means that we love God. John describes what loving God looks like. Keeping his commands. Loving God is not saying that we love God. Loving God is not trying to find an experience or an emotion or some warm, fuzzy feeling toward God. Loving God is doing what he says. This is quite a thought considering how many people claim to love God but do not do what he says. We cannot declare ourselves to be Christians who love God and do not do exactly what he tells us to do. But notice that loving God is not just obedience. Notice the qualification to our obedience. The end of verse 3, his commands are not burdensome. They're not a burden. Now, can we say this is true in our lives? Do you see the commands of God as not being a burden? God's commands are good for us. His commands are given for our own best interests. Obedience is our desire because we love God. If we feel like God's commands are a burden, then it should identify that there is a problem in our hearts. It shows that we see God's commands as a duty rather than a love. It shows that our obedience is not coming from our love for God, but coming from an obligation that we think we must observe. God is not calling for obligation, but for love. Conquerors are those who joyfully obey the commands of God. They love God and they want to be pleasing to God and not self. Verse 4, here is a powerful truth. Whatever has been born of God overcomes the world. John has spent quite a bit of time proving that we are born of God. Those who are walking in the light, loving God, and loving one another are born of God. Therefore, we have overcome the world because we have been born of God. John just zeroes in on exactly why we have overcome the world. And that is, last two words in verse 4, our faith. We have a song of encouragement that we sing, faith is the victory. The song uses metaphors of battle to describe the victory we experience as Christians. What are we victorious over? John is not speaking of the world in a physical kind of way. That is, that we are overcoming people who live on the earth. Rather, John has used the term the world to describe the sinfulness of the world. John instructs the Christians that we cannot love the world or the things in this world because it is sinful. He's already made that point here in this letter in 1 John 2 verse 15. This is the overcoming that we are experiencing in Christ. We defeat this evil world and achieve victory through our faith in Jesus. Through Jesus, we are able to shift our affections away from the world and to the Lord. We are able to overcome sin. We are able to overcome Satan. We can be victorious over temptation through our faith in Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. Remember that John taught this victory back in the second chapter in 1 John 2 and verse 14. John reminds them that they have overcome the evil one. We need to hear these encouraging words often. We can overcome. We can overcome the vices and weaknesses, temptations and sins in which we are easily entangled. But we must rely upon this victorious faith. It is not just saying, I am going to do better. It is not just trying harder. I think these efforts often end in failure because we're trying to fight Satan by ourselves, which cannot work. Rather, we need to rely upon the Lord for our strength. We need to build our love for the Lord, which will move us away from the love of the world. We need to transfer our affections and passions to God and away from the flesh. This victory is a love for God through faith that joyfully embraces God's commands. There is no other way to be victorious in this life and the life to come. In verse 6, John is going to explain what we have put our faith in. Since our faith overcomes the world, 
then we need to know exactly what we must believe to build our lives upon. John is going to give us the foundations for faith, what we need to believe concerning Jesus. Notice the statement that is critical here. Jesus Christ came by water and by blood. Now, there are a number of different ways that this has been interpreted, but we must keep in mind the context, and that is the false teachings that John is fighting against. Remember, John is fighting Gnostic doctrines, which declared that Jesus was inhabited by the Son of God at his baptism, and then the Son of God left Jesus at his crucifixion. With that in mind, it seems best to understand Jesus Christ coming by water and blood as reference to his baptism and death. The Son of God who came into the world at the birth of Jesus was the same one who was baptized and received divine approval from the Father. He is the same one who shed his blood on the cross to redeem humanity. The Son of God experienced both. John tells us that there are three things that testify to this truth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three things converge in total agreement to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. The Spirit testifies that Jesus is the Son of God. Soon, when we get into the Gospel of John, we will read John 1, verses 32 through 34, that John bears witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The water, which refers to the baptism of Jesus, testifies to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Further, the blood, which refers to Jesus' death on the cross, testifies to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Matthew 27 verse 50. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. The proof is there that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The testimony of God is the greatest thing that we have to know that we are following the right person. God has given his testimony about his Son. God cannot lie, remember? God has declared through three important witnesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Therefore, the one who believes in the Son has the testimony of God with him. And what is the testimony of God that is so important to have? Well, John states it here in verse 11. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. God has given us eternal life, and that life is only accessed through the Son. To deny the life, baptism, and death of Jesus is to deny eternal life and be separated from God. And that's the point that John makes in verse 10. If we do not believe the testimony of God, then we're saying that God is a liar. And that is a critical truth, that if we do not accept and live by means that we are declaring God to be a liar. Jesus is where eternal life is found. If we do not give our lives completely to follow Jesus, then we are looking for another Savior for our lives, and we're making God a liar. Life is in his Son. Therefore, as John says down here in verse 12, the one who has the Son has life. Now, as John wraps up this letter, we get to the purpose statement 
of his letter. Verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. This letter has intended to instill confidence in the believers of Jesus that they know that they are in a relationship with God. Jesus is God. When we believe that and submit to his authority by walking in the light and joyfully keeping his commands, we know we have eternal life. But John also gives us two more areas in our lives where we can be confident in the Lord. Verse 14, John says that we can have confidence towards God because we are able to have confidence in prayer. Just listen to these reassuring words. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Your prayers are not empty, meaningless words. Your prayers are not merely a formality. Your prayers are not only heard by the walls. Your prayers are heard by God. God listens when we talk to him. How easy it is for us to forget that God is listening to our prayers. I think sometimes we pray just because we feel some sort of obligation or duty to do so. God hears when you address him. Verse 15 continues to give us confidence. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. God hears our prayers. God answers our prayers that we ask of him. Now we need to understand that God's answer to our prayers is no many times. Sometimes I think we do not believe in this truth that God hears us and answers our prayers because we don't get everything we ask for from him. John reminds us, that we need to ask according to his will, verse 14. God has to answer no to our prayers because we do not know what is good for us many times. Did you ever pray to God concerning that first person you had a crush on that you would just be together forever? Aren't you glad God answered no to that prayer? Now, now when you look back on it, Garth Brooks even has a song about that, thanking God for unanswered prayers. There are things that we ask God in the moment when we are short-sighted and cannot see what we need that we are glad that God refused. We need to think about this in terms of how our children ask things from us, their parents. Parents have to say no to many of our children's requests because what they are asking for isn't good for them or helpful to them. If my children ask me if they can go play in the middle of the street, my answer is always emphatically no. Well, why? Because I'm a big old meanie and don't want them to have fun? Well, no, because it's not in their best interest. It's not for their good to do so. Just because God answers no does not mean that God did not hear us. When I ask the question, why didn't God answer my prayer? I'm just revealing my heart of selfishness. And I'm acting like God is my personal genie who must always do what I ask. When I take a stance that God did not do something for me, then I am revealing the heart of a bratty child who does not appreciate the goodness of our Father in heaven. We must trust God that he is acting in our best interests. We know that God is acting even if we cannot see him acting. Therefore, we can have a confident faith knowing God hears and is acting on our behalf. Therefore, we use prayer to help our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in sin. And notice this is the point made by John in verse 16. We are to intercede for them in prayer. We see many of examples of this in the scriptures. I mean, just think about Jesus while on the cross, praying on behalf of those who mocked him and crucified him. We see Stephen also praying on behalf of those who are stoning him to death. We need to pray for each other's souls. We need to pray when we see one of us going astray. We need to pray for God to give them life. Pray they will see the light and seek the Lord. Now this also is a text that has caused confusion and a variety of false interpretations. Some read about sins that lead to death and sins that do not lead to death and have taught that there are certain sins that cannot be forgiven. You may have heard of the seven deadly sins or mortal sins. Some teach that if these certain sins are committed, that one cannot have eternal life. However, the scriptures deny such an arbitrary list. Consider the criminal on the cross. 
He was on the cross for insurrection and murder. In short, he was a terrorist. However, Jesus said the criminal would be with Jesus in paradise. Murder is not a deadly sin. And there is not some set of actions that cannot be forgiven. So, what does it mean that there are sins that do not lead to death? The answer becomes clear when we think about this question. What sins can you commit that do not lead to your spiritual death? The only sins that you commit that do not lead to your spiritual death are sins that have been forgiven. Remember way back in the beginning of this book, in 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, from what now? All unrighteousness. Notice that all unrighteousness can be forgiven. John does not say that there is a certain act that cannot be forgiven. Therefore, the only sins that lead to spiritual death are sins that have not been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. The sins that do not lead to spiritual death are those sins that have been forgiven by Jesus. John is speaking about Christians who turn away from the faith. The problem is not that the Christian commits an act of sin. When John taught again in the first chapter that if any Christian says he has no sin, then he's a liar. The problem is that the Christian who is willfully choosing to persist in sin, the one who lives a life in constant opposition to God. And notice that John does not command us not to pray for them. What John says is that this is not the situation he has in mind in this discussion. He is talking about Christians who fall into sin. We are to pray to God for the sins of one another. We practice this when someone asks us to pray for them, either on an individual level or when they come forward and ask the congregation to pray for them. But John is not talking about Christians who have left the Lord in rebellion and are living in persistent sin. John is saying that we ought not to think that forgiveness is going to occur in those instances. Verse 17 concludes this thought, all wrongdoing is sin. There are not big sins and little sins. All wrongdoing is sin. However, there are sins that do not lead to our spiritual death. That is, when we seek repentance. The difference between sins that lead to spiritual death and those that do not lead to spiritual death is in the heart of the Christian. Is the sin accidental? The Christian remorseful? Seeking the prayers of the Christian community? Turning the heart back to God? Or is the sin intentional, without remorse, not listening to the reproving of the Christian community, and turning their hearts against God? Finally, the Apostle John teaches that we have confidence in our protection. There are three we know statements here in these three verses. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who has been born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We are under the protection of Christ. We have confidence in our salvation. Satan cannot touch us. Further, verse 19, we know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Those who are born of God have a changed perspective of this world. We do not look at this world as good or just. The world is in the hands of Satan. The world runs under the power of the evil one. But we are confident that though we live in this wicked world, we know we are from God and are secure with him. Finally, verse 20 teaches us the third thing we know. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. The Son of God has come and revealed to us everything we need to know so that we can have a relationship with him. When we are in relationship with the Son, then we are in a relationship with the true God and know that we have eternal life. Then we come to John's fascinating end of this letter. With his passionate words to his little children, the Apostle John appeals to his readers to keep themselves from idols. John is calling for us to reject the false and embrace the real. Idolatry is anything that occupies the place due to God. Do not be misled to put your hope and security in anything else in this world. Our hope is only in Jesus. Our security is only in Jesus. When we are with Jesus, then we know we have eternal life 
and are with our Heavenly Father. Next time, we'll look at John's second letter. Looking forward to that study. Thank you so much. Have a great and wonderful day. Amen.